Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. Maria Angelo Qatar, a renowned worldwide lecturer and researcher on aesthetic medicine. Dr. Maria Qatar serves as fellowship course director for the Aesthetic Anti-Aging Fellowship in Dubai. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria, for joining me. And I'd love to learn more about you and how you got involved with A4M and the aesthetic program that you are clinical director for. So as clinical director of the Aesthetic Anti-Aging Fellowship Program in Dubai, how did you initially become interested in pursuing aesthetic medicine? To be honest, uh, it all started when I started to see the signs of aging in myself, you know, physically. So I developed an interest in aesthetic medicine. I looked for evidence-based uh, treatments, products. Um, this was way back in 2002. And uh, then I started an aesthetic clinic in Dubai. And just a year after that, I had heard about the A4M. I actually went to Chicago to meet uh, doctors Goldman and Klatz. And they both uh, kindly met with me and showed me their uh, promo video about the A4M. And it was really fascinating. And uh, Dr. Goldman asked me to speak in London at that time. Subsequently, uh, Dr. Goldman set up the Dubai A4M Congress and exhibition, um, which took place in 2010 and 2011. But I think at that time, the region was not ready for anti-aging medicine. So um, currently, we have a different kind of approach uh, into initiating anti-aging within our uh, region. We conduct more targeted small workshops on uh, subjects of interest such as women's health, the bioidentical hormone replacement, rather than go for the big congresses like you have here. And you draw from the Middle East community or internationally from Europe, Asia? Yes, we do have an international uh, pool of physicians that uh, come to us. You know, Dubai is very much sought after. People love to come there. The weather is nice. And of course, coupled with uh, these workshops that we do, I think it's very attractive for a lot of people. We have people coming from Japan, from Thailand, from Australia. We had few people coming from Canada and Europe, of course. So prior to you getting interested in aesthetics, what kind of medicine were you practicing? Uh, well, before that, I was actually a professor at the Faculty of Medicine in Kuwait for many years and uh, we left Kuwait when during the invasion, um, you know, the Iraqi invasion in 1990. So uh, we actually ran away. Mm. It was quite uh, daunting. I'm sure there's yeah. a crazy story there. Yes, that, <laughs> very crazy. And so we landed in Dubai because my husband had an office there and uh, there was nothing for me to do. So. Uh, and as I told you, I, I saw the signs of aging so in my face, and I set up the uh, aesthetic clinic. And it was a learning curve. And there, was, there is no formal, at that time, there was no formal uh, teaching course that one could do to learn about aesthetic medicine. We just learned from the odd congress or company-directed workshops. So it was very sporadic. And that's why I really see a great value in a course like the A4M have set up whereby any physician can actually come to grips with the, all the theory and the practical aspects of aesthetic medicine. And you know, it's, the field has developed greatly over the years, and we have a lot of, lot of evidence-based procedures now. So as writer and publisher of over 40 scientific papers, very impressive, <laughs> um, what are the primary subjects and topics in which you are interested? A, Currently, um, it's where I like to, to write about fillers. Um, we have a great interest in uh, collagen stimulating, uh, one specific collagen stimulating filler. Did you happen to bring any with you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not I'm FDA. <laughs> okay. It's not as yet FDA approved, hopefully by 2019. Wow. It's uh, really an amazing product where you can 
very, in a very natural way, restore the face and give very long-term results. Is this a product in which you are involved as an investigator? Yeah, I'm actually on the medical advisory board of the company that manufactures this product. Uh, I have been for a few years. And uh, we have treated over 6,000 patients in our clinics. Wow, it's worth product. the trip to, to Dubai <laughs> just to have that injection. Um, so with a background in academia, um, do you find that you prefer teaching in a more academic setting or training physicians hands-on with what you're doing at the Aesthetics Fellowship in Dubai? No, I think the hands-on is of great value. It's very, very interesting to interact with the, all the different physicians, and we always learn from each other. It's a two-way street. It's not just us teaching them. Everybody has their own experience, and it's uh, really wonderful to be able to see how other people do things as well. You know, you always pick up a thing or two. But uh, I love teaching, I think. I think that's my calling. So when you were a young woman, and did you grow up in Kuwait? No, no. Uh, I was born in Cyprus. Wow. And then my father relocated to Lebanon. He worked in Lebanon. My father was of Italian origin. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in Lebanon. And uh, I went to high school there and then to university in England. And, uh, you know, but for me, uh, I love the Middle East. I feel at home, ba basically, although I'm not Arab, but I grew up in that region and it is home for me. So anywhere in the Middle East has a special, I have a special affinity for. And what initially sparked your interest in going into medicine? It all, I've always had an interest. From well, the time it's, it's you were a little girl? Yes, since I was a little girl, yeah. And as far as the teaching, when did you, when did that uh, spark ignite in you? That, you, <laughs> that you wanted to go to work in the academic setting? Um, because, well, that happened because I did a PhD in pharmacology. Wow. And uh, at that time, um, it's a long story, but uh, I was supposed to come to the National Institute of Health here in, in Washington. And due to circumstances, uh, I went back to the Middle East. And so I went to teach at university there. As a female physician working in aesthetics in Dubai, do you have to face any criticism from your peers in the medical community? No, not at all. You know, uh, we have a lot of professional women in Dubai, and the ladies, the, the Emirati ladies, are very highly motivated. Many of them are very well educated, um, and they hold very high positions. There is a lot of respect for women in the Emirates. I'm happy to hear that. Mm. So if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you would be doing? Oh, God, I cannot imagine. <laughs> you can't imagine doing anything else? No, I can't imagine doing anything else. So what has been the most rewarding part of your journey? It's the gratitude from my students and the bonding that I have with the students. The relationships the relationship, that you develop? Yes. That's beautiful. So do you have, I know you probably over the years that you've been teaching, you've been a mentor to many. Do you, um, is there anybody in particular that you seek mentorship from? Uh, as an individual, I mean. As yeah, a physician, yeah. as a uh, woman, as a businesswoman. My husband. Oh, that's so nice. My husband, yeah. He's always been very supportive and he's a, if, even if I say so, a brilliant businessman. And I think he's been the backbone to the way I have developed in this field. Is there, at any point during your career, have you um, had any regrets along the way? Anything you wish you had done differently? Not really. No, looking back, no. And what does the next five years look like for you and your professional life? I, um, I always strive to learn more, um, looking into something to be able to uh, have different exposure to aesthetic medicine in a formal way. Maybe just look into more aesthetic uh, treatments, uh, research different kinds of treatments so as to be able to teach better. So the 
term anti-aging medicine or functional medicine or integrative medicine. They seem to be interchangeable. What do those terms mean to you and how, and how you practice medicine and teach anti-aging and aesthetic medicine? Um, well, of course, preventative medicine is really the call of the day, you know, and I think it's of great, great value. Uh, unfortunately, we don't practice that in our institution at the present time because I also am the director of uh, a series of clinics in Dubai and we only f we only focus on aesthetics and plastic surgery but I think uh, these things go hand in hand uh, you can't do good aesthetic work if the person is not in good health or is not hormonally balanced so uh, it would be a great thing to have that additional service that we could give to our patients. Do you foresee at any time in the future that that might be able to happen? We are working on something, but we, we need somebody dedicated to uh, regenerative medicine, preventative medicine within the organization and somebody who is very competent. So due to the restrictions and the political bureaucracy that we have here in the United States and the FDA, um, there seems to be um, you know, the, a lack, for, for lack of a better word, of um, you know, therapies and modalities that are available here in the United States compared to Dubai or internationally. Can you expound on that? Um, yes, I mean, we, we know that the FDA is rather slow at approving different products and uh, devices. Uh, for example, uh, we know that there are about the over 160 CE marked, that means European marked fillers. And of course, CE marking means that in the Middle East we can also, um, you know, uh, use them. That. But uh, in the U.S., I believe it must be seven or maximum ten fillers wow. uh, that have been approved. So how, with a patient, with having a buffet of, of options to choose from, how do you decide it's what not, works It's best? not really the patient that okay. decides. No, how I, do you, as a physician, yeah. decide which protocol is best for a patient which? when you have so many to choose from? I understand what you're saying. It is, it is also a dilemma for us. I mean, but we have, as physicians, we need to gain our experience, uh, make an educated guess based on our scientific knowledge as to what we want to offer. We can't possibly offer the full plethora of services and fillers and treatments. So we need to be selective and, uh, and give good results at the end of the day. And educate our patients as to why we do what we do or why we use the products we use. And what other protocols or, or modalities do you have internationally that, that you feel would be so beneficial for us to have here in the United States? Uh, to be honest, in, in terms of equipment, let's say lasers, uh, I think we all look to the U.S. Um, to get the best quality devices and machines. Um, of course, there are a lot of Chinese, Korean, uh, Italian machines on the market, but the top of the range are the U.S. That's uh, good to know. <laughs> lasers and energy-based devices. So that stands, and um, thank goodness. <laughs> exactly. They're dependable devices, uh, safe devices, and so all high-end clinics will selectively choose. American uh, lasers and energy-based devices. Is it your experience that the international patient or, or consumer, so to speak, um, is very well educated as to what protocols they want, and is there a high level of demand in specific area of aesthetic medicine? Uh, when you talk about international patient, uh, our experience is with the Middle Eastern patients. Right. And definitely there is a huge demand for aesthetics in the Middle East. Um, I think this is to a great extent due to, the, due to social media and the unfortunate advent of these bloggers who, uh, who are influencing very young ladies, very young girls, teenagers to seek fillers and Botox, which they're not supposed to have done, you know. So 
that's probably one of the reasons there's such an interest and because of the fact that it's filtered down that they can, women can do a lot to retard aging and to improve and, and why not and there is especially in the Gulf region um, they have that extra disposable income uh, that also perhaps motivates them to go for these things but uh, in the Middle East as opposed to Europe, where in Europe people want more natural results, uh, more sort of uh, gentle treatments, uh, they don't want anything to be very obvious. Many of the Middle Eastern patients want their treatment to show. Hmm. Not so much in Dubai, wow. but in Lebanon. Really? Yeah. So they want it totally obvious. They, they want it obvious. Done. For example, in our practice, we totally refuse. You know, we have to do things according to what we think is right. I mean, even if the patient wants overfilled lips or huge cheeks, we just won't do it. Because we feel the onus is on us to educate the patient that beauty is the splendor of nature and they have to look natural to be beautiful. So we're kind of fighting against them. Um, and how about for the physicians that go through your program? So there must be a struggle there for you if you see that they are not doing things conservatively. How do you manage that? You know, do you it, have any control at all? Once they've gone through the course, I mean, they're exposed to the way we do things, and we just hope that uh, they will adopt our philosophy. But at the end of the day, we don't have control. The problem is sometimes uh, patients try to dictate what they want and it takes a very strong personality or somebody who is uh, let's say not really that materialistic to be able to say no I just won't do it and to refuse but we yeah. do try to educate them right I mean uh, right. so the patients that come to your practice mm -hmm. so you try to educate them as well as to what they should or shouldn't do and if uh, clearly you know from your conservative approach and much more natural approach um, does it you know come to stand that you have to in fact talk the patient out from doing certain procedures yes we do we, we spend a lot of time uh, talking to the patient and uh, we have presentations of our work to show them what we can do and how we're doing things luckily the older ladies uh, are more conservative what we face is th the very young are the ones that want this over and they want to do things that they really don't need whereas the like the ladies in between the 30s to the 45 the working force the professional ladies no they're into natural results and they're much easier to deal with but in any case it's our duty to educate them well, thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to taking a trip to Dubai and trying yeah, out that new please. collagen. <laughs>